Good day, students. So welcome to part six of the Algebra 2 Trig Regents Review for January 2014. In this installment, we're going to be going over problems 28 through 30. All right, so let's take a look at uh, problem number 28. Um, this is a problem involving um, identities. It says, show that secant theta sine theta cotan theta is equal to one, is an identity, all right? So how do we show that the left side is equal to the right side? Well, one good strategy to use is to um, express every single trig function as a parent trig function. Okay, so think about the mom of possible trig functions. I um, refer to my parent trig functions as the sine and the cosine, sine theta and cosine theta. The reason why I call these the parent trig functions is because all the other trig functions depends on the combination of one of, or both of them um, in order for them to be created, okay? So if you express every single thing as sine and cosine, which are the parent trig functions, then um, you should be able to um, carry out the identity proof with ease. So we have secant. Now let's recall some of our identities here. Secant theta is a reciprocal identity. Do you remember what secant theta is? Secant theta is equal to 1 over cosine theta. All right, so with that, I'm going to replace that secant with 1 over cosine. Remember, the only trig functions I want to see here are the parent trig functions sine um, and or cosine, okay? So sine is already good, so leave that alone. Cotangent has to go. Do you remember how to express cotangent using a combination of one or more of this? This is a uh, known as a... Um, quotient um, identity, cotangent theta is uh, cosine theta divided by sine theta. All right, it's also the reciprocal of tan, but tan is not a parent trig function, so this variation um, is will suffice. So now I'm going to make my substitution here. So um, secant, instead of secant theta, let me write it again. So we have secant theta, sine theta, cotan theta equals 1. We want to show that the left side is equal to the right side. Okay, we want to show that this entire expression is equal to 1, then we're done. Uh, all right, so secant theta will be expressed as 1 over cosine theta times sine theta is its parent trig function, so leave it alone. I like to express this as a fraction, so I write it over 1. Cotangent theta. Quotient, using a quotient identity can be expressed as cosine theta divided by sine theta. All right, so the goal again, do not forget, is to make the left side equal to the right side. You're processing the left side because the right side is rather simple, just one term. So let's see what happens here. If you notice, we have some um, division action taking place here. Cosine goes here once, cosine goes here once, sine goes here once, sine goes here once. And when you reduce every, multiply the numerator, you have 1 over 1. Is 1 over 1 equal 1? Absolutely. 1 is equal to 1. That checks out. So we proved that um, this equation is in fact an identity. All right, let's take a look at problem 29. It says, find to the nearest tenth of a square foot the area of a rhombus that has a side of 6 feet and an angle of 50 degrees. All right, so in order to be able to answer this question, um, it's very good to draw, give ourselves a visual, draw the shape under consideration, okay? We're looking at a rhombus in this problem. And if you think about, think back to geometry, rhombus um, is a quadrilateral where um, all four sides are congruent, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, a square is a special case of a, of a rhombus, but not all rhombuses are squares because sometimes the angles could be are greater than 90 degrees or less than 90 degrees. In this case, you notice that uh, the pair of angles is actually less than 90 degrees. So let's go ahead and sketch um, our uh, rhombus. <clears throat> so there goes our rhombus right there. So what you want to note is that uh, all four sides are congruent, okay? All four sides are um, congruent. So um, we also have to put the angular measure somewhere. So if you look at this rhombus, you notice that um, we have an acute angle here and an obtuse angle here. 
so it's more appropriate for us to put 50 degrees right here and then we're told that one side is six feet so if one side is six feet what do we know about all the other sides remember all four sides of a rhombus are congruent okay so every side is um, six feet long all right so we have um six feet six feet all four sides measure is six feet okay so this angle right here is 50 degrees and um uh if you think about what this angle is this sum of the sum of these two angles right here um is going to be 180 degrees so this is 50 this is going to be 130 degrees but we don't need that um for this problem all right so what we're going to do now is basically split our um rhombus into two congruent triangles okay how do we know that um, these two triangles are congruent using the sas um congruency postulate side angle side we know that these two triangles are congruent now anytime you have an sas triangle and you want to find the area there is a unique formula that can be used to quickly compute the area um, of that triangle do you remember what that formula is first of all what is an sas triangle um, an sas triangle is a triangle that um, you have two sides and an included angle provided all right side angle side you notice how this angle is between these two sides that's what makes this an sas triangle all right so the area <clears throat> of a situation where you have two sides of a triangle and an included angle the area is um, simply going to be one half a b sine c all right a b represents the um the two sides and then C is the included angle. All right, so let me just draw a situation for you. So this is a different triangle. So let's say you were provided with two sides and an included angle A, B, and then angle C. The formula for the area of this triangle is one half AB sine C, all right? So we can even label this triangle in such a way that it's consistent with this formula. Uh, we can call this side a this makes this little a side b that makes this little b and then this is angle c right there which is 50 degrees all right well you notice that this rhombus is made up of two congruent triangles okay so um the area of a rhombus in this case the area of our nice little rhombus is equal to twice the area of the triangle because they're congruent okay so instead of one half a b sine c we're going to double two times one half a b sine c all right the first a b half a b sine c is for the top the second one for the bottom you double it that's the sum of the two areas all right so we're going to have um you see in this triangle that a is six b is six is an isosceles triangle big C is 50 degrees. So we're going to have 2 times 1 half. I should have counted the 2s, but it's okay. Um, times A, 6 times 6, sine 50. All right, so let's simplify it so we can enter in, into the calculator with E. These two cancel out. So we're going to enter 36 sine 50 into our calculators. Note we're working with degree mode here, so our calculators have to be set to the right mode. All right, so I'm going to be using uh, a TI-89 titanium calculator here. The mode is set to degrees, so I'm going to calculate simply 36 sine 30. I believe that's what we put earlier. Okay, yeah, that's what we had. So 36 sine 30, uh, I'm sorry, 50. Enter, count enter for decimal approximation, 27.5776. Okay, so our area um the area of the trap of the rhombus is um approximately 27.5776 okay let me look at it again just to make sure i didn't ruin it okay good but uh let's go back to the question for a second the question says we need to round it to the nearest tenth okay so the tenth is the digit right behind the decimal point to the right of the decimal so you're rounding it to this place right here. So to the nearest tenth, the area of the rhombus is going to be approximately 
square feet. So that's the area of a rhombus. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the last problem in this installment. So it says the following is a list of individual points scored by all 12 members of the Webster High School basketball team at a re recent game. So we have 2, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, 10, 11, 12, 14. So let's find the interquartile range for this set of data. So let me just tell you the formula first, and then we'll go ahead and generate the terms to plug into our formula, um, and then we'll, we'll compute what it is, all right? Interquartile range, for short, can be abbreviated as IQR. IQR is equal to quart, uh, quartile uh, 3, Q3 minus Q1. Okay, the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. So Q3 minus Q1 um, would help us find the interquartile range. So what on earth is Q3? What on earth is Q1? So let's go ahead and determine what that is. So let's rewrite our data set. We have 2, 2, Three, four, six, seven, nine, ten, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen. Now, one thing you must know: before you start generating um, the quartiles, the the data set must be arranged in ascending or descending order. Okay, so we notice that the number is already ordered in ascending order. You don't have any number. Um, Increasing and then decreasing again. It's just strictly increasing. Okay, two, three, four, five. You see the pattern there. All right. So now that it's in um, ascending order, first thing we must find is um, the medium or Q2. Okay. So we must find Q2 first. Find Q2, which is equal to the median first. All right. Now, if you think about it, let me give you an illustration here. Let's say you have a cake, or a circular cake, and you're asked to split it up into four quarters, okay? What would you do first? Will you try to just uh, break it into quarters? The, if you want to make it as symmetric as possible, the smart thing to do will be to first break it into two equal halves first, right? And then with the two halves you have, you break it again, into your four quarter quarters. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. So the first thing we must do is we need to split this data set by the median into two halves. And then is gonna, we're gonna have the lower quartile and the upper quartile. And then the median of the lower quartile will be Q1. And then the median of the upper quartile will be uh, Q3. Okay, so the first step is let's find where the median is in this data set. So since it's already ordered for us, we wanna find the middle Okay, so the easiest way to find the middle is to count from out, outside, inside. All right, I'm going to use um, Roman numeral here to do my counting. So let's go from outside to inside. Okay, so one, one, we take a step in, two, two, keep on going, three, three, we're counting in from the out exteriors, and then this is uh, four. Four. This is five, five, and this is six, six. What we're looking for is the center. Okay. So if you notice that we this is split down, it's even. If you count them, they're going to be a total of six. I'm sorry, twelve elements in my data set. All right. So the middle or the median is right here. That's what Q2 is. But since there is no number in the middle. What we'll simply do is we're going to average these two numbers, okay? So our median Q2, um, Q2 is simply going to be uh, 7 plus 9 over 2, okay? 7 plus 9 is 16 over 2 is 8. That's a median. So what does our median help us to do? It helps us to break our data set into two quartile, into two halves, okay? We have the lower uh, um, quartile and an upper quartile, the lower half and the upper half, okay? So in the lower half, the, med the median in the lower half is our lower quartile or Q1. And then the median in this upper set right here is our upper quartile, which is Q3, okay? 
All right, so now let's act as though we have only this data set. All right, let's act as though this one does not exist. So if we focus on this, what's at the middle here? So we're going to do the same counting procedure again. So we're going to start from out and count in. So we have one, one, two, two, three, three. So what's at the middle? We don't have any number there, just like we didn't have any for the Q2. So this right here is our lower quartile, uh, quartile Q1. So, so that's Q1. Since we do not have a number, what are we going to do? Exactly what we did here, which is we're going to average these two numbers that are around the uh, lower quartile. So Q1 is simply going to be 3 plus 4 over 2. All right. 3 plus 4 over 2 is um, 3.5. So this is Q1. Q1 is 3.5. Remember the formula is Q3 minus Q1. We already have Q1. Next thing we need to find is Q3. So how do we find Q3? To find Q3, um, we're just going to now shift our attention to the upper half. The median of this upper half is our upper quartile of Q3, okay? So let's go ahead and find it again. We're gonna count from the outside. Um, an easy way to do this is you just use your fingers and just count in, but I can't put my fingers here, so that's why I'm putting numbers. So let's count from the outside. We have this is one, one, two, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. Exactly what happened here. That's, that's um, expected, okay? Uh, if you divide it evenly, that should happen. So this right here is the upper quartile Q3, um, Q3. So we compute the value of Q3 just as we did Q1. We just average these two numbers. Uh, it's going to be, uh, what is it going to be? 10 plus 11 divided by 2. 10 plus 11 is um, 21. 21 divided by 2 is 10.5. So Q3 is equal to 10.5. OK, so we're asked to find the interquartile range. So we write a formula IQR, the interquartile range is equal to the upper quartile minus the lower quartile, Q3 minus Q1. Uh, so that's going to give us 10.5 uh, minus 3.5. Our interquartile range is 7 uh, units. OK, so that's that. So thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. Feel free to subscribe to our channel so you can get updates to the next um, review installments of this review series. Uh, do post a comment to let us know what you think about this presentation. We appreciate it. You can give us a thumbs up if you liked it. More clips can be found on mathcodeserve.com slash testprep.html. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.